In southern Florida, there's a unique world of water, swampland, and dense jungle-like forest. The Everglades, a truly magical environment full of mystery, myth, and fascinating nature. For many centuries, this huge swamp area was inhabited by the Seminole Indians. Today, the Everglades are one of the greatest natural attractions in the USA, and the tourist industry here has grown accordingly. Despite its increasing popularity, this region has, for the most part, managed to remain unspoiled. However, in the middle of the last century, this unique natural habitat was threatened. Extensive plans were drawn up to drain the swampland for agricultural purposes. Indeed, this was carried out in some areas until the full value of the region's ecology was officially recognized and a nature reserve established here. So, in 1947, the Everglades National Park came into being. Over the years, the nature reserve has been extended and today, the park covers an area of around 500,000 hectares. It protects the southern section of the Everglades and covers almost 20% of the total wetland area. The region was first mentioned in the 16th century by Spanish explorers. They were unimpressed by what now have become the main features of the scenery. They considered the swamps and the forests to be both uninviting and menacing. To the Spaniards, the Everglades swampland was of no practical use and because of the native Indians who inhabited it, posed an even bigger threat. It's believed that at that time this region was dominated by five Indian tribes. This is one of the few areas that still contains traces of the Native American Indians who once lived here. We've come here to search out an infamous and much feared inhabitant of the wetlands, the alligator. This primeval creature has always fascinated man. Unlike the somewhat daunting appearance of the alligator, the surroundings here are far more benign. The pink flamingo has for many years been associated with Florida, and everywhere the croaking of frogs fills the air. There's a huge variety of bird life here, as the vast areas of swampland are an ideal habitat. The water here is not only rich in fish, various predators can also be found here in large numbers. The alligator is less aggressive than the crocodile. However, it's best to treat the alligator with the respect that it deserves. Charles Talley knows well how dangerous these reptiles can be and he's also familiar with all the dangers posed by this watery region. 
We accompany him on a diving expedition to the hidden treasures of the Everglades. As the water contains few nutrients and the vegetation is sparse, this underwater world lacks the diversity of color that is to be seen in tropical oceans. Nevertheless, the subaqua world of the Everglades has a special kind of charm. Hundreds of small springs bubble from the sand below and provide a continuous supply of fresh water. Throughout the year, the water temperature in the Pahaoki, referred to by the Seminole Indians as the Grass River, rises to more than 20 degrees Celsius. Suddenly the water begins to whirl around and we discover a creature that we didn't expect to find in this wilderness. The dog is fortunate that there isn't an alligator lurking nearby as it would have made a tasty snack by now. The water here is an ideal habitat for the pseudomid turtle. This variety of turtle lives close to the shoreline as it likes to rest in the sun. For the turtle, the sun is important as it raises its body temperature and also aids its digestion. In the spring and autumn months, the pseudomid turtle migrates to certain favoured areas in order to reproduce. Our visit to its natural habitat is not much appreciated by the turtles here. With its remarkable swimming abilities and strength, this one tries to escape. However, we manage to gain hold of it. We dive further into the depths beyond a number of rocks. But despite the fact that the water in the Everglades is so clear, the daylight soon turns to darkness. The poor visibility creates another challenge. Who knows what kind of creature may suddenly approach us from the void? So we decide to move to a strategic position and we're soon rewarded. In addition to various fish, we come across a turtle that is to be found in vast parts of North America as well as in some regions of South America. It derived its name from its powerful snapping abilities. A far more common inhabitant of this region's rivers and ponds than the turtle is the perch. With more than 8,000 known species that have been classified into 150 different families, perch are to be found all over the world. The perch is one of the most highly developed species of fish. One of its most striking features is its great curiosity. It appears to examine everything it sees.
As the perch is a predator, its curiosity is mainly fired by the nutrition offered by the various life forms that it sees. Each variety of perch is not only ever vigilant, but also extremely adaptable. A total of 600 species of fish live in the waters of the Everglades. In the summer months when the water level is particularly high, there are huge shoals of fish to be found here. But in the dry months of winter, they travel to deeper waters. As the perch don't seem to be interested in us anymore, we eventually move on. We're searching for another legendary representative of this region, a creature that's usually to be found in coastal areas. But in recent years, the number of manatees has declined, so we must be satisfied with the various other natural inhabitants of this fascinating underwater world. Located on the northern edge of the Everglades, the main source of the water in this region is Lake Okeechobee. It's the third largest freshwater lake in the USA and covers a total area of around 1,720 square kilometers. We continue our dive among a vast array of plant life that is the natural habitat for a large number of small creatures. Our concerns of possible attack by alligator have given way to the magnificence of this intriguing underwater world. The large shoals of fish here attract numerous waterfowl, so creating a unique and rare biodiversity of indigenous wildlife. The shoals prove to be advantageous as many of the predators in these waters are confused by such large numbers of fish. Some of the fish have already become used to us and have lost all fear. But Charles Talley has planned something else for today's dive, so we leave the fish behind. Beyond a number of rocks is the entrance to an underwater cave. We gradually enter it through an opening. Cave diving is one of the most exciting underwater adventures. However, it's also one of the most dangerous. Each year several divers are killed in underwater caves. This is quite often due to lack of safety precautions and inadequate equipment. It's best to remain safety conscious at all times. Teamwork is also vital in such a potentially hostile environment. A 
Only highly experienced divers should venture into such dark and narrow caves. It's important to make sure that all the equipment is fully operational, including air tanks and batteries. Within the caves there's virtually no daylight. Our lights therefore are essential. In some sections the caves are higher than the water level and hundreds of bats also live here. Man often fears both the alligator and the bat, but those here are not blood-sucking creatures. Only three South American species of bat live on the blood of other animals. The bat has a highly developed social hierarchy but its most amazing feature is its natural radar that helps it get around in the dark. Most of the animals that live within this cave, such as this crab, are blind. The total darkness of their habitat has gradually taken away their sight. It's now time to leave the underwater caves and their many natural inhabitants. We cautiously exit through the narrow opening and return to the spring at the entrance to the caves. good to see daylight once again. We're only a couple of kilometers from the area where we first encountered the King of the Everglades. The alligator is the undisputed king of these marshlands. No other creature is as powerful. The reptiles languish in the sunshine along the shoreline. We travel to another dive. We don't only intend to observe the alligators from the shoreline, we also want to see them from within the water. They're everywhere. Because of their valuable skin, they were once almost exterminated. This seems to be a good location. We dive into the clear water. Charles Talley once hunted the huge reptiles. Today, he simply wants to observe them. He's head of the diving school based here at the Everglades. Despite his vast experience, today we're unlucky. There are no alligators to be found. Various water plants shine out in all their splendor. Beneath the water, the light also creates some beautiful effects. But it's best to remain on one's guard. At any moment, a Mississippi alligator could appear, and with it, immense danger.
For the alligator, the vegetation here is the perfect place to hide, so we must continue to be extremely cautious. Though we do manage to disturb some harmless fish. We're anxious to speed up our search and make it more effective, so we pull Charles' tally and our boat from beneath the water. Soon we're successful. The alligator doesn't appear to be concerned by our presence. We dive close to the bottom. This way we hope to get as close as possible to it without scaring it. Little is known of the wild alligator and how it may react to divers. Fortunately, Charles knows what he's doing. This is not his first encounter with this great saurian. From a safe distance and trying not to attract its attention, he follows the alligator. Suddenly there's a cloud of sand and we're concerned that the alligator may attack us. But our fears prove to be groundless. The alligator has moved away. The alligator's behavior surprised us and we have now lost sight of it. It's quite unnerving to know that we're in the same waters as an alligator and that at any moment it could suddenly reappear. It seems that the reptile was also a little wary. Charles spots the animal once again and suddenly finds that he's much closer to it than he'd like to be. One blow from its muscular tail would be enough to kill him, but the alligator remains calm. After this first exciting encounter with the primeval reptile, we decide to travel deeper into the densely vegetated jungle areas of the Everglades. The remoteness of the freshwater swamps and the surrounding forests once offered an ideal home for the Mikosoki Indians. At the beginning of the 17th century, the Spanish forced some of the village communities of the Mikosuki to move to Florida. So it was possible to define a clear border between the Spanish-held territory and that of the British in the north. The land occupied by the alligator thus became populated by man. In the 17th and 18th centuries, these reptiles continued to thrive and the Mikosuke Indians were not a threat to them. However, 
However, following the American Revolution and the foundation of the United States of America, the Indian way of life in Florida began to change. White settlers began to move into the western and southern areas of the region. In 1818, various disputes finally culminated in the First Seminole War, when the Mikosuki successfully defended themselves. The most remote areas of the Everglades became more important in the middle of the 19th century. In our search for further alligators, we encounter several other animals. Due to the encroachment of man, today much of the local wildlife, such as the otter, has diminished. It's a wonderful swimmer. The local biodiversity is evident in the air, on the land and in the water. The largest fish in the rivers of the Everglades is the hornpike that can grow up to more than a metre in length. It's a predator and thus favours tranquil places from which to attack its unsuspecting quarry. The predator that is feared by most other fish must itself be careful not to end up as prey for the alligator who is at the top of the Everglades food chain. Now we're looking for a suitable campsite. We find a good spot that's clear of vegetation and remain vigilant, always wondering what could be lurking nearby, and always with the feeling that we're being secretly spied upon by the natural inhabitants of the swamps. Nearby, there's a poisonous water moccasin. It's vital to wear protective boots. A bird also displays a flurry of nervousness. A snake up in the tree turns out to be a relatively harmless tree adder. While traveling through the Everglades, it's also a good idea to keep an eye on its tinier creatures. Huge swarms of mosquito are quite common here. The humid climate attracts many different types of insect that are a source of food for various animals. Some of the insects are far from timid. This particular specimen is quite brazen and is perfectly at ease with this. Insects and fish here are good sources of food for the more than 350 bird species that inhabit the Everglades swampland. Small rodents also like the dense vegetation. Nature provides a diverse range of living conditions here.
Much of the Everglades is a veritable paradise. Colorful butterflies and exotic plants are in abundance. But it's also possible to see a wasp tending to its young. One of the most endearing creatures to be found here is the raccoon, but it appears to be oblivious to the dangers that are close by. An alligator is not too far away. However, on this occasion, the raccoon survives. The alligator appears to have already enjoyed a good meal and decides to wander off. Until quite recently, there was a small private zoo in a village on Silver River that kept a number of exotic monkeys. However, some of the animals managed to escape into the nearby forests, where they still live today. Both the vegetation and the climate of the Everglades provides the monkeys with an ideal habitat. Indeed, their numbers have grown extensively. They are surprisingly friendly, so much so that some eat straight from our hands. But we can only provide a small amount of food, so they eventually leave us to go in search of more. The further we travel up Silver River, the more alligators we encounter. Most of them completely ignore our canoe. And we try to be as inconspicuous as possible while journeying among the Everglades' amazing fauna. The awesome power of the alligator is not something that manifests itself very often. Judging by the large numbers of alligators here, we appear to have arrived at one of their favorite haunts. Even though the alligator is a member of the crocodile family, the characteristics of both species are quite different. Unlike the 30 other varieties of crocodile, the alligator has hardly changed during the course of millions of years. Despite the many large reptiles that surround us, we decide to dive into the waters of the Everglades once again in the hope of meeting yet another alligator below the water. This is unlike any other type of diving experience. Although the last few days have shown us that the alligator can be a rather docile creature, it is of course always best to be prepared for the unexpected. Soon we're not disappointed. A huge alligator appears, whose full size is only apparent from beneath the water. The largest specimens can reach a length of up to six meters and can weigh almost half a ton.
With their muscular legs and sharp claws, it's simple for an adult alligator to overpower a human. Its huge jaws and sharp teeth could tear its victim apart within a few seconds. However, this one remains calm. It's a fallacy that the alligator is a bloodthirsty, murderous creature. As unprovoked, this primeval reptile is almost indifferent to our presence. Even from a close distance, it remains perfectly calm. Its calm demeanor is not surprising, as the Colossus has no natural enemy to fear in the Everglades. We also are not a threat, otherwise we'd have doubtless felt the full might of the alligator's temper by now. All the creatures that live within this remarkable region deserve to be protected. To learn more of the kings of the Everglades, we visit the famous St. Augustine Alligator Farm. St. Augustine Alligator Farm. Alligators belong to a group of reptiles known as crocodilians. Crocodilians have been around since the age of the dinosaurs, and some of those got to be as big as the dinosaurs. There was one that was called Gapialosuchus, and it got to be 45 feet long and had a six foot straw. That crocodile became extinct about seven million years ago. Thank goodness. I say that because it was native to Florida. These days there are 22 kinds of crocodilians, and they fall into four basic groups. The Gabrielles, the Caymans, the Crocodiles, and the Alligators. If you look on an alligator's back, you'll see ridges. Those ridges are covering bony plates. It's alligator armor. And within those bony plates are blood vessels that help alligators to regulate their body temperature. Also, when you see them in the water, out in the main pad or out in the swamp, look for white scars. Those are battle scars. Alligators are very competitive amongst themselves, and they try to assert a dominant it's over their neighbor. I thought right now would be a very good time to mention that an alligator should happen to bone them. See, I'm up here behind me while I'm doing this show. How about sharing that information with me? <laughs> Every once in a great while, we run into a crowd that won't say anything. You look like that kind of a crowd. Crocodilians have a series of flats and bounce. This is Skippy. Skippy is only a couple of months old. To help them when they submerge, can include those nostrils. That is Snap and Sam. I'm going to get this alligator to raise his head up and open up his mouth a little bit. Hopefully after my head is clear. I can't guarantee how much pressure Sam's going to slam his jaw shut with. He's been averaging him between 3,000 to a little low. Okay. One, two, three. And that'll be it for me, folks. <laughs> Regardless of how well he slams his jaw shut, I'm only going to do this one time. If you miss Thank you, Sam. Let's hear from Sam here. Listen, I'm real sorry. I'll have to come back next year for the same Following our visit to the St. Augustine Alligator Farm, our next destination is a nearby lake. The trailers of the pickup trucks contain several airboats, the typical mode of transport in the Everglades. The airboats are well suited to travelling on the extremely flat surface of the Everglades waterways. Their huge propellers consume a lot of fuel, so are not environmentally friendly. They're also very loud. 
Therefore, the airboat cannot be used for the observation of wildlife. The lake's hunting season has begun. In recent years, the number of alligators here has risen quite substantially, and so some hunting is permitted. Today's hunt is under the strict supervision of the local authorities. Of a total of 4,000 alligators that live in this lake, only 200 are permitted to be killed. At breathtaking speed, the hunters chase across the lake on their small and extremely mobile airboats until the land once again becomes peaceful. They're hunting for alligators. Strong spotlights light up the darkness. The shining eyes of the reptiles give away their position, so making it easy to spot them. They're only allowed to hunt the adult alligator. Those with a length of around 1.5 meters are spared by the hunters and are normally set free immediately. In order to protect the local ecology, the number of animals that are permitted to be hunted is strictly controlled. The local police keep a record of each animal that has been killed. The dimensions of each one is carefully documented. 53, 27 and a half, 6, 6, 6, yes. In a butchery that specializes in alligators, first the skin is removed, this is a skillful job, but it is important not to damage the valuable skin. The lean white alligator meat is cut up into small joints and is exported from Florida to various parts of the world. The skin is also sold. Purses, belts and shoes are still produced from alligator skin. We've now arrived in northern Florida and travel on a small motorboat on Crystal River. It's become colder. Dark clouds move across the mist-covered landscape. This region is also populated by numerous colonies of birds that seek out huge quantities of nourishment from the fish-filled waters. We've come to see one of the rarest natural inhabitants of the United States the manatees. The family of this round-tailed sea cow comprise three varieties. Those here are the river manatee. In order to get a little closer, we join them in their natural habitat. The Florida manatees favor warm water. Despite their impressive size, they're absolutely harmless. Indeed, it's even possible to stroke them.
The manatee can grow up to four and a half meters long and weigh over 1,500 kilograms. Yet, they move serenely beneath the water. Because of its huge size and weight, the sea cow moves along quite slowly. No need for worry, as it has no natural enemies. As the name, the round-tailed sea cow, suggests, it has a large, round, paddle-like tail. The tail gradually developed from the rear quarters of a four-legged plant-eater during the course of manatee evolution. The oldest fossil finds of its ancestors date back almost 50 million years. At that time, it moved around in shallow water and on land. Early seafarers reported that they had seen sea cows that looked like mermaids. But they must have had an overworked imagination to have believed this. Their docile character has not always been an advantage to them. The manatees were once mercilessly hunted for their meat and oil. So the West Indian manatees were for many years one of the most endangered species in North America. Now they're threatened by the propellers of motorboats and also fishing nets that have caused many of them to be killed. Today, the manatees are a protected species. Despite this, their population is only recovering at a slow pace. So the future of these mighty mermaids is still uncertain. During the winter months, when the ocean temperature cools down even in this region, these sensitive animals swim into shallow bays and river estuaries. The open sea is usually avoided by these placid and extremely trusting mammals. As the water that is situated close to various power plants is warm during the winter months, the manatees choose to remain there rather than swim further south. Now, as an increasing number of power plants have been shut down in recent years, there are even plans as how to artificially warm the water in the areas frequented by the manatees. The necessity to protect these gentle herbivores has now been fully recognized. Unfortunately, the Stella's sea cow became extinct in the middle of the 18th century. The Everglades. This almost endless river of grass, with its astonishing biodiversity of plants and animals, is one of the most fascinating natural habitats in the world. Yet its future existence is still not assured. It is only when each of the plans for the drainage of its swamplands have been withdrawn and that the full value of this national park and the entire area of its surrounding wilderness have been recognized that this region and its natural inhabitants will be able to survive in the future. However, despite all the recent encroachment by man, 
the world of the alligator and the manatees have retained much of their mysterious and magical aura. The allure of this unique region still continues to impress in a remarkable way.